first off, Bart. Well, put, well, uh, John, before we start, sure. Um, we are going to put an embargo for Bart's sake on uh, a certain school south of Pennsylvania. So we're going to uh, let's put an embargo on that right now. Bart's had a bad enough week on that front. Did I drunkenly email the Alumni Association and Athletic Department to cancel the donations I had made that week? Yes. Wow. <sighs> so we'll embargo the uh, redacted place south south of Pennsylvania. Uh, um, we can just, and, anyway, we've got enough state. problems without that. Wow. Um, yeah. Bart, Bart, you sound like you're still attempting to recover from uh, Brawl, comma, Backyard. John, my soul is broken. <laughs> Who's coaching? I didn't even Neil watch the Atlanta anymore. United game on Saturday. Neil, Brown. Neil Brown's the head coach. Still. Uh, no, I, no, I know, but Pitt. Oh, Pat Narduzzi. Is Narduzzi no. still there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like they've had the same coach. I feel like Narduzzi's been there since Dave Wonstad left. They had, um, oh crap, <sighs> not Todd Graham. God, Todd, Todd Graham. Well, I, I would imagine it's not Todd Graham because if it's Todd Graham, this program might have shut down. I, well, well, and Todd would have left. I think he did leave. What well, it's just basically Todd Graham goes in for a year, coach <sighs> doesn't leave. Um, anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, you John, my soul you. is not in a great place this morning. That's why I sound like I'm still recovering. Also, my voice is uh, a little yes. gone because I was busy yelling at a certain income poop who managed to, again, break my soul. Um, so, Todd Graham, Keith Patterson, Paul Chris, Joe Rudolph, Pat Narduzzi. Paul oh Chris. I forgot that went through a coach a year for the good decade. Um, yeah, but. Arsenal beat Tottenham. That's great. Well, we got and... some we got some refing down here to talk about that one. We, <sighs> we do uh, as a part of the discussion, but no. But uh, first thing that I wanted to go into with you this morning is involving the uh, the the promotional walk that was had at WBD uh, the WBD uh, glass encased building in New York City, where it is now officially official. The U.S. men's national team have a, a new head coach. We have not had you on since that promotional walk and subsequent press conference. Uh, now that Mauricio Pochettino is here, he is officially official. All of the uh, Chelsea-based contract uh, elements have been apparently sorted and signed. And so now Mauricio Pochettino, the worst-kept secret in all of international soccer, is now nigh anon and now a part of the U.S. soccer community. What say you, Bart Keeler? Well, I thought you heard a lot of similar things to what you would have heard in a Greg Berhalter con, uh, conference, but you also heard a lot of different ideas, but also framing of some concepts. Um, you know, look, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's going to be a drastic change in how this team plays. Uh, you know, it'll still be a team that wants to have the ball. How they get that ball will be a little different. Um, you know, he emphasized a lot of running off the ball, both defensively and offensively. And I think that specifically will be a, a key change as we've, we've grown accustomed to seeing the U.S. national team be stagnant in possession and seem like they're out of ideas. And that, to me, comes from a lack of off-ball movement for your teammates. And so... That in particular could be an immediate change that unlocks the athleticism and fitness levels that American players have and uses them in a positive way. Um, but he he seems to, you know, uh, there's a reason he's been a very successful coach at a lot of big clubs is because he understands what he believes and how to communicate that to the players. Um and I, you know, it sound again. It, there were some things he said that were similar to what Greg Berhalter would say, but they sound different and they are framed differently. Um, and then there's a lot of different things that he mentioned, and and those are what I'm hoping that we can see bear out in the ne- these next two windows. Jarrett with Bard on the national team, 
Anything in your mind from uh, the signings and such? Um, I guess what's your, I guess, runway with this where you're kind of is what's the runway like in terms of, hey, there might be some bumps in the road while we get everything installed, while people get acclimated, that sort of thing. Um, you know, what's what's your runway here with like how comfortable, how, how long you're comfortable with just kind of maybe hiccups? for lack of a better word, I know we're two years out from a world cup, so we only have so much time. Well, I think, you know, he said it himself that they're not going to make excuses and they're not going to, you know, look at this and say, Oh, well, we don't have the time. And he said there is time. So he wants us to hold them to that standard. Um, But, you know, I think you have two friendlies in October where it will probably be a little rough to watch the team figure out what they're supposed to do at given times during the game. But again, I don't think that there will be a drastic change from what we were trying to do with Burhalter versus what we were trying to, will be trying to do with Pochettino. I do think there will be key points of emphasis that are different. And I think those are the things that Poch in the immediate timeframe can communicate with the team and say, look, this, 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 great, but this is what I want you to do. Or these are the things you need to be worried about off the ball and on the ball. Uh, But then, you know, in in November, you get into Nations League. And as much as we joke about playing a Caribbean country in the middle of November, Greg Berhalter's team struggled against these early round nations leagues opponents in this kind of secondary tier in CONCACAF. And, you know, you don't have the runway to screw up there because you need to be in that nations league final come March because, you know, the, the amount of truly competitive matches um, is very low going into the next World Cup, and you need to use these as preparation to be able to, you know, respond when a team that is playing for something comes out and hits you in the mouth. Because we saw that happen in Copa America, where a team that was playing for something and playing with some passion that our team clearly didn't have, you know, when they came out and punched us in the mouth, we took that and stepped back a few steps and didn't really have a response. So those are important games because we know that those teams, and this is something he also touched on in the press conference, those teams come to compete, they come to fight, and they come with passion every game. And if those aren't exist, if those don't exist within the team every single time they step foot on the field, uh, which they have not under Greg Berhalter, and I think he is very much to blame for that, despite people wanting to blame players. Yes, Greg never approached a friendly as a do or die situation. And to be quite honest, from the sounds of the the press conferences leading up, he did not approach Copa America as a do or die situation. And, you know, the Argentinian desperation, the Argentinian passion, hopefully translates from Pochettino to the U.S. men's national team. Looking at just some of the the quick quotes from the – the opportunity football is to touch the right button and start to perform. And we need to really believe in achieving big things. We need to believe that we can win, that we can win not only a game that we can win the world cup in quote. And he said, players are so intelligent, so talented. They can play in a different way for sure. I think we have time to integrate whatever uh, philosophy that uh, Mercia Pochettino wants. He says the circumstances after the Copa America situation weren't good for the players to manage in the last two games. But the most important thing is, to see the potential that we have, I see very good players, end quote. I send the message to every single player around the world. They have the door open, considering that no MLS players saw Copa action and 23 of the 26 were European-based. Cade Cowell, the late replacement for Gio Reyna, was the only Mexico-based U.S. player called into the last three camps. So, mm-hmm. obviously, Pochettino's trying to hit the right buttons in the press conference. He's trying to win the press conference by saying mm-hmm. – Things that folks want to hear. Right, absolutely. He um, He's experienced this. He's been at a lot of clubs. Um, and, you know, he's that. that's why I do think that to an extent 
it it's he's going to say the right things and say them in the right way because there's a reason he got hired at places like Tottenham, like PSG, like like Chelsea. But the fact that he, for the most part, has been able to take what he says in a press conference and then apply that and communicate that Mm -hmm. is different than I think, again, that we had with the guy previous. Because, (laughs) and, And I'm sorry, like, it's just... I'm not trying to make Greg out to be this terrible coach because Jurgen Klinsmann is a terrible coach. Greg Berhalter just wasn't doing his job well this past cycle. The rec- the recency attachment is where you are with with your discussion. But the yeah, but the, the reality is, John, we had to make a stark decision after the Copa America tournament to move on from the guy who, in theory, was hired to get us to the next World Cup. So you are going to compare them. Um, and again, I just think I go back to the the idea of intensity and urgency Mm -hmm. um where he talks about you know we're not here to play we're here to compete talking about the players um talking more about the players about how his coaching staff will be evaluating them from day one you know nothing is not no opportunity to evaluate players ability to compete and perform in a match is going unused um and, and hopefully that translates to actual winning. And I think as if any U.S. fan will tell you that sometimes winning isn't even enough. You know, beating Trinidad by the skin of your teeth in a two-legged tie isn't enough. You know, barely qualifying for the 2022 World Cup by finishing third is not enough. If you're going to be the big dog in the region, you need to dominate the region. And hopefully – this mentality, these minor adjustments to this playing style can help. Bart Keeler hanging out with us at Bartimus Prime 19 for the Soccer for US POD yeah. at Soccer for the Soccer for US pod at Soccer for US POD on the 280 character app. Also on the table this morning, I do want to get into the late night that some of us had watching uh, activity Ooh. in Colombia. We will get into that. We've also got some refing down here for Bart. And, uh, Bart, I'm going to try to keep you for 15 minutes so you don't completely and totally blow out your voice. Uh, <laughs> so we, I, will, I will try to keep you till uh, 1030 and just to, that way you can get into your, uh, your honey and diving into everything else. Uh, Jared, anything else on your mind, U.S. national team-wise, before we head to the youth national team and the chaos last night in Colombia? Yeah, so I know he, he left it open. He said, you know, look, everybody, everybody's on the table here. Um, any kind of off the wall names that you're looking at for people who are eligible, who maybe have fallen out of favor to get back into the mix for the U.S. national team? Yeah, I think the one that has the biggest, I guess, opportunity to uh, get back into this group is maybe a Jordan Pifak, um, who has been playing really well at top level leagues for several seasons in a row um, and has just clearly not been favored by Burhalter, Right. And I'm not saying that he is definitively better than any of the strikers we've seen, but he's clearly doing something right for club. Um, and, and so a guy like that is someone who I think just can benefit from just different eyes looking at the player pool. But I've said all along, I mean, look, the reality is the player pool is what the player pool is. And if you don't think that Tim Weah, Christian Pulisic, Gio Reyna, Weston McKinney, uh, you know, if those guys aren't the best players we have, if Jedi Robinson and, and Sergio Dest aren't the two best fullbacks we have, then I, I don't know if I can, tr- you, you're a reliable narrator <laughs> in, in the story right now, because that, that's just the issue. Now there are going to be some French players that I think can benefit Um, you know, and, and there might be guys who are currently with the team that get a little bit more priority. I'm thinking maybe a Luca Della Torre, um, possibly Marlon Fossey. Um, but at the same time, it is the player pool is not going to just magically get better. You know, what we hope is the players who come into camp respond to what he's telling them and can execute better. 
For those that uh, decided to stay up late and knew where to find it, FS2, uh, the chaos that was happening last night in the tournament that is going on in Kali and various and sundry other cities, mm. the U-20 World Cup, the U.S. is now in the semis. Once again, local love, Jordan Dudley, Riley Jackson, uh, a part of this. The U.S. was down 2-0 in the second half. And I would swear up and down that there were two chances for penalties to be called in the 70s and the 80s that were not. So Germany had a 2-0 lead going into 90-plus. The U.S. scores at 90-plus 7. The U.S. scores at 90-plus 8 to equalize, to send it to an extra 30. Players just basically tried to survive and not to totally, you know, cramp up in that 30 minutes. It goes to PKs. U.S. wins 3-1 in PKs. And the chaos that was there bordered on, truthfully, national team after dark. I mean, it was out of control last night, but the U.S. makes it to the semis in the U-20 Women's World Cup. Come back for the ages. At his, yeah. At his <laughs> and, and, the way, and the way that it's being looked at, it's goals at 90 plus eight and 90 plus nine. Yeah. As opposed to 90 plus seven and 90 plus eight. So, yeah, go ahead and go ahead and add to that. So, 90 plus eight, 90 plus nine. You go down 2 0, you tie it at two, you go to PKs, you win in PKs, you're now in the semis. Holy ish. Yeah. Will got a great point. Like, this is it. it, it I mean, we, we got our, we, the second goal Germany scored was even late, right? I mean, that was the thing that I, I wasn't able to. Yeah. I wasn't able to watch this game because I was uh, flying back from Pittsburgh, which I will maintain is one of the most underrated cities in this country. Um, and so I'm like, I'm, I'm able to keep up with it on Twitter and I'm getting the notifications. I have landed. I'm on Marta, like all these things. And um, I did. I, I, I don't want to say I turned it off, but cause I didn't, but like, I was like, all right, well that sucks. But as my continual stances, you know, the goal of these youth tournaments is to get there to show well. And with most youth tournaments, the crapshoot is a crapshoot. Um, make the knockouts and see what can happen. And hey, look, Germany's not a bad team. Um, they clearly have talent. Uh, and you know, from watching the highlights, it's not like the US got completely dominated. It's just the fact that Germany got a penalty kick called for them. Two actually. We saved one in the first half. Um, and we'll talk about that in Ooh, just a second because i yes. want to talk about that young lady uh, um but that is to go back to pochettino for a second he mentioned the u.s women multiple times in his press conference as being the model of how to compete and how to fight how to win and they showed that last night why this program uh you know despite tracy kevin's coaching them is finding ways to win games <laughs> despite <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I I just you, I think you oh, heard me rant about Tracy Kevins, and I don't know why she's still employed. But um, I, it, I think the thing, John, is, and this is where, for all those who bemoaned somehow that this talent was gone from the U.S. team, mm -hmm. this is one of the most professionally infused rosters we've. I think it's the most professionally infused roster we've ever sent to. Um, any of these competition, World Cup competition. And I think that was one of those things that shined last night is you saw players who understood what it meant to physically and mentally fight to get a result because they have to do that with their club teams, right? right. Especially in NWSL where, you know, every week it seems like we have a new team that's out and in the playoffs. Um, there's a lot of at stake in NWSL. And so that, that to me was what came through last night and the, the quality and the determination of these players. And it's, it was absolutely insane uh, to, to see that match go the way that it did. Yeah. I mean, John, that last goal was um, that um, Sentinel scored was, was determination and grit. She just beat the goalkeeper to the ball. Yep. Um, and again, that that is talent, but that is desire. That is playing hard, playing through the whistle. Uh, and that was it was a wonderful comeback. Uh, and then 
we could talk about her. It's Tegan Y, who not only saved the penalty in the game, uh, yes, had the game winning save uh, after, as you mentioned, hometown girl Riley Jackson Ooh, scored yeah. the, the third penalty kick, but sealed it basically. Yeah. But Tegan Y had a fantastic game in goal uh, as as a whole. She looks. I haven't been sold on her before this tournament, to be quite honest, mainly because um, it's hard. It's really hard to tell in Concacaf. <laughs> Uh, it just is. I'm sorry, but she has balled out this World Cup, in my opinion. And whoever ends up drafting her, or not drafting her anymore, whoever ends up signing her in NWSL or possibly abroad, I mean, I think she would make a, a team like <clears throat> mine, Arsenal, cool. um, a thousand times better. Uh, she's going to make a fan base very happy. <laughs> um, it, it, it's uh, It will be. Uh, intriguing to say the very least when it comes to what you're looking at from the the group that was there uh i it was it has been a great watch to see them work their way through the tournament and getting into the semis uh you know that is uh that it's been that's been a fun watch so far um all right so seven minutes uh, like i said i'm gonna keep you to 30. So that way your voice doesn't die. Um, there was some refing down here this week. Mm. And uh, one of them has to do with moments in the other match that you were paying attention to that has uh, nothing to do with the, the backyard brawl. Uh, the possible well, kind of a backyard brawl. Well, yeah, true. That is absolutely true. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the NLD, as it is uh, either hashtagged or, you know, like if you're one of the cool kids and you refer to it, you know, as, as the NLD, the North London Derby, and you have to do the finger pistols. Not to be confused with the NLDS. No, 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 no. That, that would be an early round of the playoffs. Uh, Arsenal knocking off Spurs 1-0. Uh, Mikel Arteta admitted that he lost sleep trying to figure out what his lineup was going to be. I'd like to thank him for the the back line that he did construct because that really did help me out in fantasy this past week. I give him full credit for that, and I started Gabrielle. Uh, the red card on the Urian Timber foul on Pedro Poro. Contact with the ball, then contact with the player. The ref shows yellow to Urian Timber, checked by VAR for a potential red. Mm -hmm. It was waved off as no red card. And this goes off of the Curtis Jones, Eves Basuma challenge about a year ago. But there are things that you look into account about force and getting to the ball first and contact with the player. Walk us through that. Yeah, I think um, specific to this incident, you are looking at. We can't judge intent, John, but you can kind of infer intent to play the ball. Right. Um, and so this, to me, wasn't red card worthy because this was within a natural action of play. Okay. Right. Uh, the player was in control of himself for the most part. While he may have been careless slash reckless with his challenge, he was in control. He was doing something within a normal play of the game, right? This was not a uh, serious foul play by any stretch. And that's just what we're looking for. If you look at this and go, yeah, that serious foul play. Was that something that was, uh, you know, using his body to target and flick pain on another part of the other person's body? You know, it, it, just because there is a nasty challenge uh, doesn't always mean that it's a red card. Um, and I thought this was a, a decent example of just going through the step of, okay, rec careless. Yes. Reckless. Absolutely. Serious foul play. No, because it wasn't foul play, right? If this was just, well, yeah, you, you miss time to challenge. You may maybe miss aligned your challenge, if you will, uh, aim, your aim was off. The challenge was misaligned. Wow. Um, but this was not, a, the, to me, this was just not an example of serious foul play. And so, therefore, it's not a red card. It's not dog so. It's not any It's not any of those things, right? This is within the, the natural realm of playing soccer. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, one of the other points that I wanted to discuss had to do with, and we see this a lot, 
where you will have a save made by a keeper mm -hmm. and it's a parry or a push or what have you. The, the save is made by the keeper and it forces another outbound motion. He doesn't hang on to it. He's either pushing it, parrying it. You know, it's a, you know, a reflex action to push it away from the body. So you get that reflex action or the parry from the keeper and it goes into a player whose arms are away from the silhouette. And it's not it, just because on the rebound off of the save, mm -hmm. it hits an arm that's outside the silhouette. The handball, no handball discussion comes up because while well, the player's hands are away from his body, it's not a natural position, but it's coming off of a goalkeeper save action. What's the, what's the idea there? Ooh, yeah, I think this is um, – I, I think we had a handball discussion, yeah, in the Rebs game um, that kind of fell under this as well where, yes, you want to have them not have, a, you know, the arm outside the natural silhouette of the body. Uh, we are looking for if this is a relatively natural position for the arm if you're trying to play soccer, <laughs> right? Yes. But we also do try to take into account a little bit the, uh, the ability to – react or not be at fault of a, a weird deflection right, right? um you know uh, the other thing that needs to be said is you cannot score directly from a handball so if the attack if this were you know the attacker hitting the, their arm and then they score you can't do that um so you know there's there's obviously when the ball hits your hand from a short distance or a, a random deflection unless you're the attacker who then scores. Yes. <laughs> We're not really looking to call that because you have to allow for some, you have to understand that the ball is going to hit you in random places on your body because it bounces randomly. Unfortunately, though, it's a sphere. Um, it does not always act in a logical manner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, like I said, I just, I, I wanted to uh, run through those particular moments mm -hmm. and uh, get your thoughts on it on, on a on a purposefully shortened segment with you because like i said uh if you don't have your pipes then it doesn't help you out in having discussions with other folks and doing the all pipes are there the uh <laughs> the, the just, rest they're of, just tired john the, the rest tired. the rest of the body is kind of trying yeah. to catch up they're and just going, tired uh, tired of playing the game huh T tired of uh Ooh. tired of being insane yeah <sighs> absolutely true uh, all right, so uh, we will let you. We will let you go and get a, get in a morning nap or anything else that you need to do. The honey. And well, the I am at work currently, so that won't happen. Well, <laughs> in well, the well, office. Well, no. What you need to do is you need to create like under the desk, like uh, George Costanza. What yeah. he did do the same kind of a thing where you can kind of hollow out your desk and turn it into a living space, so you can actually sit there and. And, and function and, and do more than one thing. And folks can sit there and wonder where you are. They open the door and they don't see you sitting at your desk. And you're like, you know, I'm underneath my desk. I'm actually having some fun. Uh, all right. So uh, get back to work, my friend. Uh, my apologies about backyard brawl and uh, the back and forth fourth quarter that I know probably took 10 years off of your life. And uh, we will catch up with you when uh, we'll catch up with you, obviously, in this sense next week. And obviously, if anything else happens when it comes to national team stuff or anything bat signal worthy, we will catch back up with you soon, my friend. Save the pipes and uh, hollow out your desk and turn it into a Costanza-like setup. Well, y'all have a wonderful Monday. And remember that um, sports are just sports. I have to <laughs> remind myself of that yesterday and today. Sports are just sports until they mean more uh, all the time. Well, all right. We are an SEC country. Yeah. All right, y'all. Have be a good, good one. All right. Be good, Bart. Thank you. Bart Keeler. I didn't realize that Bart was at work. No wonder he was kind of talking a little low. All right. So uh, I, I was wondering about that. Um, now, it was. Uh, yeah. So I, I didn't know that. I know that um, I'm guessing that Bart is in the office today because he was not in the office on Friday because he was flying to Pittsburgh to go see Backyard Brawl. I think that's how that worked. Uh, all right. So that's Bart. 